He who cultivates a garden and brings to perfection flowers and fruits, cultivate and advances at the same time his own nature. Urza Weston, 1845. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I am Barbara Walker, and I am the commissioned lay minister here at West Shore. I see many new faces tonight, to many of you, but most of whom I recognize. And I want to especially welcome our newcomers. If it's your first time here, welcome. West Shore strives to be a community that welcomes people of all faiths, backgrounds, and continually we work towards being inclusive of everyone. Tonight's program is a part of a series of monthly programs that we do here at West Shore called the Third Thursday at West Shore. And it came out of a desire to practice spirituality in our everyday lives all during the week and also have a space to share our stories and our sense of community with those around us. I am proud to say that this program has survived five years and grown even during COVID. We didn't do as many, but the word on the street is that it will continue monthly, so be sure to check the e-news and the Shorelines, our monthly newsletter, to see what our topic is, because it's always different here on Thursdays. We do know that next month, we are gonna focus on a program on how we meet people where they're at, in whatever stage of life they're at, young, old, or anything else. And we will talk about the hospitality of communication with those who are different from you. So you're invited to come share that special evening with us on Thursday, September 15th. And I also wanna announce that I just secured on October 20th, a program that will be the viewing of one of our own, Maya Wehner, who is a member here. And it's her documentary that she made of the Children's Choir and Joe Schaefer. So you'll wanna make sure not to miss that special evening. So tonight, tonight's program on the spiritual of gardening actually is rescheduled from the spring. And I am so glad we waited. Because this summer I was able to connect with many of you West Shore gardeners and hear your stories. I'm not an avid gardener myself. The cactus is about the extent of what I can keep alive. And as we were walking in here tonight, it dropped and broke and crashed on the floor. So this is not a good sign. So I created a storytelling posse. And they're going to share their stories that take us back to our childhood, connect us with our past, our present, and our futures. And with our firm desire to live into what is our UU seventh principle of respect for the interdependent web of life. So most of the storytellers tonight are West Remembers. But I want to give a special shout out to a new friend, Sarah Warner, who Keith and I met this summer. And we invited her to come and share with you her passion for eco-spirituality. So give her a good welcome. We hope tonight. Yay. We hope tonight will fill your curiosity, your intellect, and your spiritual self. So I'm going to take a moment to explain what's a little ways down in the order of service. We're going to do what we're going to call a harvest communion. But I'm going to explain it a little bit first. You all were asked to bring fresh veggies, your cuttings, your fruit, your flowers. And I'm going to invite you to, at some point to come up and take some. And take as much as you want. There's some good stuff up here. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a meditation, and you can either sit quietly in your seats and do it if that's where you're most comfortable, or you can get up and do it as a walking meditation around the room. And then at some point, just stop by and pick something up out of the garden. So. And if you are choosing to remain seated during that, ask someone beside you to pick you out something. So, and if you forgot to bring something, there are no worries. There is plenty for everybody tonight. So now, it's a part of our faith tradition to light a flaming chalice. And Brian's going to light it for me, and I'm going to offer up these words. On summer, as we light this chalice, we are glad of summer light that wakes the color in the world so early and keeps it on so late. We are glad of the light 
of the mind that does not depend on the time of day, the time of year, or the time of light to enlighten us and to beckon us inward, outward, and onward in exploration of the many realms of being. We are glad of the light of the heart that accompanies us in our search for companionship in life, for worthy work to do, and for ways to overflow in joy and in deeds of courage and compassion. Let us rejoice and praise in the many glad meanings of our light. Well, good evening to everyone, and it's great to be back here at Thursdays at West Shore. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Brian Gardner, uh, he, him. I am one of the worship associates here at West Shore. And it was about a year ago, almost to the day it seems like, that I uh, was asked to share a reflection with the congregation um, where the goal was to explore a metaphor for the meaning of life. And so I had thought to choose something that was near and dear to me, vegetable gardening. So if you all picked up on it, my last name is Gardner. So I kind of got to do it, right? I had to live into my namesake. And for me, there's something deeply rewarding about ex observing the cycle of life in a growing season from seed to seedling to a robust flowering plant that eventually bears fruit and continues to keep producing until at last the season comes to a close. And for each plant, starting as a seed, its purpose is to grow so that it can live and then live on through the fruit that it produces. But I think of the key differences there's a key difference between my life and, say, that of a tomato. And it's that my life isn't defined and codified end-to-end -end in my DNA. But even still, with some differences, are there lessons that can be drawn from the, the vegetable garden that could help to define life's meaning? Well, one thing that I really noticed a lot last year was that our backyard garden space really became an example of the interdependent web of life. Seriously, if you've got a garden, go back and check it out because there is a whole ecosystem going on. And as part of that, perhaps the most obvious, aside from the plants themselves, are the pollinators. Because without the pollinators, the plants themselves would never be able to bear fruit. So there is a lesson for us. A solitary plant bears no fruit. But beyond pollinators, we've got a whole bunch of other inhabitants in our garden space. For example, we've got snakes. They primarily eat the slugs, the slugs that enjoy eating the leaves of young and tender plants. In addition to that, we've got ants, and they build intricate tunnels that help to aerate the soil, which in turn helps the plants to better absorb water and nutrients. But then along with ants come the aphids. And so of course, then you got the aphids, what do you got? Wasps and ladybugs to the rescue. We got this whole battle royale, the spiders, well they've gotta hop in there too. They're gonna join in the fray. When I think of all of this, I would love to watch and listen to David Attenborough narrate the daily drama that occurs in our small little backyard ecosystem. Because it's so many different types of life, and they're all pursuing different paths, yet all part of a system that leads to the thriving of all involved. And while the meaning of life for all of these varying life forms is different, they are deeply connected to the garden itself, a garden that they have probably not seen in its entirety, nor perhaps could its intent be fully understood, even if it were. Do the ants, for example, know what the, the gardener's purpose is for the garden? Probably not. But even though they don't know that purpose, 
do they need to, they don't need to know that purpose in order to find fulfillment. Do they even know, need to know that they are in a garden or that there is even a gardener? And so what does this teach me about the meaning of human life? To me, perhaps the most obvious is that just as a vegetable plant is unable to reach the potential of its predetermined life's meaning without other life, again, like pollinators, we too need others in our life to reach our potential. And what our potential is, in my opinion, is up to each of us to discover. If we go into the, the Christian tradition, the, the, the story of creation in the book of Genesis, it has a garden as the starting place of human life. And so what if I took the observation I made prior about much of life inside the garden not being able to see the entire garden or understand its purpose? And I translated that idea to that of myself on this amazing planet that is able to sustain life, the earth as the garden of life. And in the same way that perhaps if we're out on a walk, we can notice that some vegetables can grow, certainly without any human intention or design. But did this planetary garden, this planetary garden oasis, in the middle of a galaxy inhospitable to life, did it come into existence through unintentional and purely natural mechanics? Or perhaps, was there a gardener that built this space for us? But in either case, this space, this planet as a garden, has sufficient resources for both survival and thriving. And like the many ecosystem of the backyard garden, the key to thriving is in working together, even though our own individual journeys and purposes may differ. And frankly, I'm not sure if I had determined my life's meaning or meanings, but I do suspect that it is connected to all of us that are here today, as well as to the millions and billions sharing this garden with us. And so I hope that our mission may be to not merely survive, but to thrive. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Judith James, and I'm a member of this church community. Gardening, for me, has been solace and meditation, whether it be filling plant pots with seed-growing mix, potting mixture for transplanting plants to larger pots, planting new additions to my garden, or weeding the flower beds. Maybe this is in my genes, as my mother always went into her garden or to her greenhouse, if the weather was inclement, to weed when I left after a visit. Like mother, transitions and changes in my life have been made bearable by digging in the dirt, whether tending seedlings under the plant lights in my basement in the winter, or weeding and digging in my garden at home, the pollinator garden, or an island here at church. Weeding and planting becomes a meditation. Watching trees bend in the wind while sitting by a terminally ill loved one's bedside was a kind of prayer, reminding me that beauty existed in the world, even in the depth of grief and sorrow. Filling pots with seed starting mix and watching new growth emerge gave hope that life would continue and grief and sorrow would ease. As the poem in this time of winter reminds me, in this time of winter, of long nights and short days, of gray and white, let us remember that waiting 
is a, is a virtue. As the snow rests upon the earth, as plants wait beneath to begin growing again, let us learn the lesson of waiting. In this time of winter, when nights are long and the days are short, let us learn the virtues of endings, of children grown and gone off, of friends departing, of jobs lost, of divorce and separation and death. Let us learn the lessons of ending. In this time of winter, when the days are short and the nights are long, when it is gray and white and cold, let us learn the lessons of beginnings. Let us learn that waiting and ending have another part to them, that we can indeed begin again, that spring will come and we will be here to greet it. Let us not wish away the winter. It is a season in itself, a resting time, a waiting time, an ending time, and a beginning time. Here at West Shore, gardening has sustained me in various ways. In the food forest, which Matthew McHale, our intern minister in 1415, had the vision to encourage us to develop. Today, the food forest is in transition to a pollinator garden. This garden, tended by a small and dedicated group of members, is in need of additional help. I, like other members of this group, am getting older and not able to dig and weed with as much vigor as when the garden first began. It would be fantastic to have new muscle to help dig in the dirt and help this space realize the potential our dream has for this area. That it serve as a visible demonstration of using native plants and shrubs. We hope it is becoming a showcase, an educational tool and an example of a low-maintenance yet beautiful and alternative landscape. Instead of lawn, this space protects our water, nourishes the soil, and is a habitat for pollinators and beneficial organisms. We are slowly transforming this space into a wildflower meadow, which we expect and hope will reduce the need for the extensive weeding the present garden requires. Both of these changes will further our intention of attracting and supporting pollinators. Also in need of help are two of the small islands in the parking lot. Most of the islands are taken care of by church members, but, well, two, one now particularly is looking for lots of loving care and attention. New, young blood is needed, so any help you might be able to give will be most gratefully received. Together, we can make these spaces havens for bees, birds, butterflies, and other beneficial organisms. I look forward to hearing from you. I do have sign-up sheets, and I'll be at the back of the church at the end of this service. Thank you. Thank you, Brian and Jodeth. So Deepak Chopra, in his Seven Laws of Spirituality, has also come up with the Seven Laws of Spirituality of Gardening. Those are the handouts that you got when you came in tonight. They describe all of those in those handouts, but I want to highlight the third spiritual law of giving and receiving before we do our harvest communion. The law of giving and receiving is also evident in gardening. Most noticeably, you have to give your time and your effort in gardening in order to produce a good harvest. This includes watering and repotting, pruning and sweating from your brow. 
You must give care and consideration to your plants in order to receive the blessing of food that they will produce. This truth can parallel other aspects of your life, such as your goals, your body, your relationship, etc. In order to produce the blessedness of yourself and life, you must be dutiful to your personal growth and consciousness. As you go through your regular gardening routines, try to be mindful of the subtle aspects of what you are doing. Give your gifts and receive bountiful harvest. So I invite you all now to take a few breaths. Ease yourself into your seats or get up to take part in the walking meditation. And as you're taking deep breaths, relax from the top of your head, relax your face muscles, your shoulders, your arms, your fingers, give them a little wiggle. Relax your torso. Don't forget to keep breathing. Relax your legs, your feet, your toes. Keep taking deep breaths. I'm going to walk you through your garden. The sun is shining. Imagine the birds are singing and you feel totally safe, totally calm, and totally at peace. You make your way down this path one step at a time. There's a soft breeze blowing and the air feels warm. You are feeling incredibly happy and peaceful. Just ahead of you, you see a very long, very high wooden fence. Right in the middle of this fence, at the end of your path, is a huge wooden gate. We're going to make our way to this gate now. You're still feeling totally safe and calm and at peace. One step at a time, at your own pace, you head towards the gate to the secret garden, which is on the other side. You reach the gate and turn the large iron handle. You push the gate open and step through the other side quietly, pulling the gate closed behind you. As you look up and take a step forward, you see your secret garden. You take a couple of steps forward. And notice a huge oak tree at the end of the garden. Make your way to that tree, walk towards it, and take notice of the things you hear. Can you hear the birds and the animals, the wind blowing through the trees, the water trickling from your fountain, or perhaps you can hear frogs croaking from their lily pods? You're amazed at the tree's size, stretch your arms out and realize it is trunk is so wide you cannot get your arms around it. You stretch your arms out and give a hug to the tree, making careful note that no one is watching you. Your back rests gently against the bark, knees bent to your chest. You take a deep breath and breathe out. You feel safe and totally calm and at peace. In fact, you don't think you've ever felt this peaceful before. Your secret garden is sprawled out in front of you and is made up of all the things you love in nature. Take another look around. Can you see anything different this time? Butterflies? other animals. Breathe in and breathe out. Take it all in. You get to have a secret garden, a place that is all for you, a place you can come back to in your mind anytime and remember what it looks like and feels like here. What can you smell here? Can you smell those flowers? Maybe the rain? Keep breathing in and out. It is now time to return back to where we started, taking all of these precious memories and feelings with us. You make your way back out to the garden gate, feeling incredible and peaceful. You reach the gate and take one last look over your shoulder, feeling safe, totally calm, and totally at peace. You look back at the gate 
turn the handle and walk through, quietly closing the gate behind you. We are back on the path now and back to where we started, feeling safe, totally calm, and totally at peace. A few more steps and we'll be back in our space here in the sanctuary. You can open your eyes, wiggle your toes, wiggle your fingers. And if you'd like to come up and pick out some produce and something from, from the, your magic garden that you all helped create tonight. Oh, and Brian said there's a few little, little round things that look like tomatoes. They're not. They're really, really, really hot peppers. So if you don't like hot stuff, stay away from them. Brian, if you want to come up and stand by these and why people come up. Keep an eye on the peppers. Yeah, take as much, take as much as you want. <laughs> That's Brian. Brian, is that one of them? <laughs> and as we end our harvest communion, we have a poem called Autumn. You can't put the seed back after the pot has burst. A featherweight traveler, the seed knows how to fly. On the edge of this little woods, I have seen the milkweed travel, the one at the bend in the path, appearing across the ravine after the snow has gone. It might have been called a miracle, that plant that walks, but for the rites of fall, like our holy days, returning every year, to reveal the mystery, pods splitting open, and the shiny silken seeds glistening in the sunlight air, taking flight in the wind and doing exactly what they were meant to do. Seeds know how to fly, and plants travel despite their roots. Miracles happen all the time. When we have learned this, there will be no turning back, the journey having just begun. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see you with us this evening for this wonderful opportunity to be together in, in the spirituality of gardening. Uh, I'm going to do a little magic and a little 
uh, fun here tonight with a few little props to enhance my thoughts. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to be here and share um, kind of how I began my journey. Uh, I think back as a young child of my interest in gardening and being outdoors uh, and the amazement of, of growing those seeds. So those little packets intrigue me. So we start with those packets. This is a mighty big one of sunflower seeds. But I remember as a child uh, taking that seed and finding it to be rather magical and working with my dad and planting these in soil. And, and yes, uh, I wasn't quite Jack and the Beanstalk, but Jerry and the sunflowers I was. So, so they kind of magically grew up and up and up. And I was probably of a tall, skinny child, but uh, they, out, they outgrew me. And so it was kind of a neat thing to kind of watch and grow and to share. There was that, that magic about plants and the beauty of them. Uh, I grew a lot of vegetables and uh, was very excited about that. Now, recently I discovered at the holidays that I like to kind of grow paper whites as an adult. And so same kind of thing. It was that magic of planting those, those small little bulbs. And normally you think of putting them in soil. So I was informed you could grow them just a little bit differently of planting them just in some water and adding a very special ingredient called gin. Gin to paper whites. They grow and grow and I think they're very, very happy paper whites probably with that gin. But it's kind of the magic of, of all that. That very special time this summer, I love being outdoors and the aspect of preparing the soil and carefully watering and, and seeing is just amazing. I especially love the flowers, the fragrance, as I said, the colors, all those very important things to kind of our senses. Uh, I must share, uh, as a child, uh, my grandmother lived with us and um, uh, because of uh, some uh, health conditions, she lost her sight. And so I remember gathering flowers often and, and taking them to my grandmother and she could hold them, she could feel them, she could certainly smell them. And they were very, very special. So I, I, I treasure that idea that a garden often um, expresses many things about the different human senses, the senses of touch and sight, hearing, smell, and taste. Gardens can be full of delightful things to touch and feel, different textures. Again, think of um, the velvetiness of a, a sunflower or, or the furriness, the featheredness, all within a flower or a fruit that you touch this evening or a vegetable. Look at the colors, the shapes, the special features and how they create a wonderful visual environment. We often listen to the sounds, sounds in the garden, the sounds of the birds, sounds of gravel, picking flowers, holding and moving water that might be a water feature, wind whistling through leaves. As you gathered the things in the meditation, think of fresh cropped herbs in your hand, walking under a flowering jasmine tree. Or sometimes flowers may have a subtle fragrance or sometimes much more aromatic. Think of those fresh things that you might have just picked, those tomatoes or those delight of, of fresh herbs. These are the words of Stanley Crawford. You pay homage when you can. I love the smell of the bulb as the earth opens and releases its harvest, an aroma that only those who grow garlic and handle the bulb and the leaves know this indescribable presence, not only in garlic, but onions, carrots, parsley, and the exaltation of a tomato. We've shared some stories tonight in the movie of Secret Garden, but think of how gardens have been in history 
and literature and music and art and poetry. So we have the Garden of Eden, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the book literature Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, the Secret Garden, and one of my mom's favorite, Better Homes and Garden magazine. <laughs> uh, famous pieces of art, Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights, Van Gogh's irises or sun sunflowers, Monet's water lilies, music, Bette Midler's The Rose, or I was just in Salzburg, Austria this summer. From the sound of music, Edelweiss. <laughs> um, from literature, Shelley's The Flower That Smiles Today, and Tennyson's Come Into My Garden, Maud. And as we shared, we'll be celebrating a harvest type of communion. Each spring we celebrate here at West Shore a flower communion that began with Norman Chapik's uh, in Czechoslovakia, a celebration in 1923 as a symbolic measure to help bind people together. And as Joe shared, our beautiful gardens that we have here, outdoor in our parking areas and our celebration of life garden in our courtyard, that offers a special place to gather in serenity, reflection, to celebrate, to meditate, to garden, pull weeds, to journal, and to even sketch. Gardens can be healing places, places of discovery and enjoyment, just like those ones in my childhood. And ones that my partner Dave and I have discovered each year through our own gardening in our yard and our travels. We've had some wonderful opportunities to visit gardens in North America, Europe, and Africa. One of my favorite transformations is the quarry in Victoria, British Columbia that transformed into a beautiful, vast garden, the Book Art Gardens. We've been up to the Meyer Sculpture Gardens in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Beautiful combination of plants and flowers and sculpture by the Meyer Collection. And then an incredible botanical garden, Kirstenbosch Botanical Garden in Cape Town, South Africa, where they've become different kinds of ecosystems from deserts to tropical kinds of plants. Incredible acres and acres of land and sculpture. But just last month on our trip to Bagan, Romania, each day we enjoyed smaller gardens, ones that were personal, ones that were beautifully made and grown. And from it, we received beautiful meals from our hosts, the vegetables and the plants. They were beautifully and proudly served to us at our meals. And these gardens brought together pride and the same thing I felt as I grew those vegetables and plants in my garden as a child. Both very, very special treasures. We here at West Shore have always been grateful to the beautiful arrangements um, that Sil Knudsen has, has created for our chancel. So we bring not only the beauty from outside, but bring it inside to celebrate. And many of those pieces were in honor of special occasions and ceremonies here at West Shore. So we're most grateful for those opportunities. So I would like to close just with a short poem. It's, it's evening now, an evening hour. It was a sunny, bright evening, an evening so calm. The kind of evening that was inviting to me with an outstretched arm. So I decided to spend an hour doing almost nothing, sitting and enjoying the best of what nature could bring. Getting up from my chair, I thought I'd take a stride. Then there was a bumblebee that suddenly came by my side. There was kind of music as the bee flapped its wing. Music so perfect that no one could ever sing. Walking a little further, I spotted a butterfly. 
which was hovering over the flowers, then soaring high. I came to the conclusion as I was on my knees, not the richest of queens was dressed like one of these. My evening hour in the garden was very well spent, and now I know what beauty and music really meant. By Perlin, an evening hour. Thank you. Good catch. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I think everyone got the soil food web, soil plant interaction, and eco spirituality packet. You will need that for a little bit of guidance through all of this material. So, I want to start off by saying thank you for having me here today to talk about a topic that has changed my world the world that lives beneath my feet. There is an unseen interconnected web of life that assists plants in the exchange of minerals and water for sugar. This process sustains life itself and is something that I fell in love with and decided to dedicate my life to. Today I will talk about the importance of science, of soil plant interaction, the intricate soil food web, and how eco-spirituality is vital to human existence. Our soils are loaded with trillions of microorganisms. In fact, one tablespoon of soil is approximately 50 billion microbes. Starting with the soil food web on page two of the packet, primary producers such as plants, lichens, moss, photosynthetic bacteria, and algae are responsible for photosynthesis that uses the sun's energy to fix carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Most other soil organisms receive energy and carbon by consuming the organic compounds found in plants, other organisms, and waste byproducts. As organisms decompose complex materials or consume other organisms, nutrients are converted from one to another and are made available to plants and to other soil organisms. All plants, grass, trees, shrubs, agricultural crops, depend on the food web for their nutrition. Growing and reproducing are the primary activities of all living organisms. As individual plants and soil organisms work to survive, they depend on interactions with each other, very much like humans do. Byproducts from growing roots and plant residues feed soil organisms, and in turn, soil organisms support plant health as they decompose organic matter cycle nutrients, enhance soil structure, and control the populations of soil organisms, including crop pests, like our lovely spider mites and tomato hornworms. I'm sure you've all experienced. Organic matter is many kinds of compounds that fuels the soil food web. Soil organic matter is made roughly equal parts humus and active organic matter. Active organic matter is available then to the soil organisms. Bacteria tend to use simpler organic compounds such as root exudates or fresh plant residue. Fungi tend to lead, lead to more complex compounds such as fibrous plant residues, wood, and soil humus. Bacteria, fungi, and other soil dwellers transform and release nutrients from organic matters. These micro shredders, immature orbid mites, skeletonize plant leaves. This starts the nutrient cycling of carbon, nitri nitrogen, and other elements. The importance of the soil food web is the living component of the soil. It is complex and has different compositions in different ecosystems. Management of croplands, rangelands, forest lands, and gardens benefits from the effects of the food web. The relationship of soil biology to agricultural pro productivity, biodiversity, carbon sequestration, and air and water quality is the most important to human-planet interaction. Soil microbial activity refers to the micro 
microbiological processes of soil microorganisms. Organic matter present in the soil feeds various bacteria, fungi, and microorganisms. When organic matter is added in the soil, it leads to high activity of levels in microbes. Conventional farming has leaned away from adding organic matter to the soil and giving it time to recover after a growing season to heavy use of tillage, leading to the depletion of topsoil where microbi microbial activity is most present. The short-term use of tillage and pesticides can be beneficial to some grain farmers due to high yields, but over time, heavy tillage and pesticide application can lead to minimal microbial presence in the soil. Erosion, loss of nutrients, loss of carbon in the soil, and carbon released into the atmosphere. It is important to protect the soil ecosystem so that, so that there is an abundance of healthy harvests in the future. To name a couple secondary consumers that we cannot see with the naked eye would be fungi and bacteria. Fungi can be grouped into three categories, including decomposers, mutualists, pathogens, and parasites. Located on page three, is the decomposer fungi. I'm very sorry you have to turn the paper upside down. I did not want to waste paper. <laughs> so the decomposer fungi is called saprophytic fungi, and it converts dead organic ma material, very much like your leaves and your brushes that we all lovely put away in the wintertime. Um, so that material can be fueled into fungal biomass, carbon dioxide, and small organic acid molecules. These particular fungi are critical in the process of turning non-fertile organic items into humus that is extremely rich in fertility and remains in the soil for hundreds of years. Mutualist, or mycorrhizal fungi, found on page four, colonize the plant roots. In exchange for carbon for the plant, Mycorrhizal fungi help solubilize phosphorus, nitrogen, micronutrients, and water to the plant. This relationship helps plants receive its needs more efficiently, leading to a quicker maturity rate and harvest rates. The most important part of this relationship is that atmospheric carbon can be stored in the soil. Global warming is one of the world's largest problems, and it can be combated with keeping the soil covered with plants to store more carbon in the soil. The last group of fungi consists of pathogens or parasites on page five. This cause, these can cause reduced production or death when they colonize roots and other organisms. But these are not the downfall of your beautiful cucumber plants. There is a nematode trapping fungi that parasitize disease causing nematodes and fungi that feed on insects may be useful as biocontrol agents. These interactions are those that few people know about, so I will ask you, will you get to know these interactions and build a relationship with the soil? Bacteria is the most present microorganism in the soil. There are six types of bacteria that roam our soil world, but I will only discuss half today. Decomposers, on page six, assist in the early stages of decomposition of organic materials, and in the later stages, fungi begin to dominate. On the next page, you will find nitrogen-fixing bacteria that extract nitrogen gas from the air and convert it into forms that plants can use and can equivalent more than 100 kilograms per hectare per year of nitrogen in the soil and is a huge contributor to the nitrogen cycle. Disease suppressors release antibiotic substances to suppress competitors and have been commercialized for disease suppression. Lastly, on, eight, on page eight, you'll see aerobic bacteria need oxygen and dominate in well-drained soil, where aerobic bacteria do not need oxygen and favor wet, poorly drained soils. Various soil conditions offer different advantages and disadvantages to the garden. One extremely awesome fact about bacterium on the next page, <laughs> is that some and very similar to antidepressants. My Mycobacterium vacci is a non-pathogenic bacterium that lives in the soil, and when it is present, it activates brain cells to release more serotonin. So if you feel more relaxed in the garden, thank these guys. Now that the sciencey topics are out of the way, 
and I'm sorry for making you all drink from a fire hose with all of that information, we can discuss the meaning of eco-spirituality. And I am sure that's what most of you are here for today. What is our role in the garden? What purposes do we serve? How do we care for our gardens just a little bit better than last year? I will state that it all starts with how we understand nature. Be sure to listen to what the plants are telling you and know that the symptoms from, are from the world below your feet. Eco-spirituality starts with understanding that humanity is born from nature. It is part of nature and it does not own nature exclusively for its own ends and purposes. The opposite of what our mainstream idea of relations with nature is today. Traditional eco-spirituality started with indigenous people that once kept America free from colonization and capitalism. From this perspective, ultimate reality, whatever you may believe in, the divine, God, spirit, Buddha, or the great mystery, is not just a source of creation. It is very much an ongoing part of creation, a part with which we can interact on a daily basis through our senses, and from such experiences gain greater insight into wonder of physical reality in our natural world. Very much like our soil ecosystem, all forms of life are within an interrelated, interconnected web that is part of the divine stance of life. Eco-spirituality perspectives can be found in all world's religious traditions. No matter how they are articulated, however, these per perspectives all provide for recognition of the importance and relevance of the power of understanding our human relationship to the planet and our direct experiences of the natural world. The more you open yourself up to the natural world, the more it will teach you, if you let it. There is a world in soil that many of us don't think to appreciate, but while you're sleeping, eating, and working, the natural world is hard at work to provide nourishment for all. Our Native American ancestors created a civilization of sustenance, life self-sufficiency, and a deep appreciation for a planet and all of its gifts. From ceremonial thanks to burning native grasslands so the buffalo herd would follow closely behind, these individuals study nature and responded accordingly. For centuries, agriculture has been the beating heart of humanity. If agriculture failed, a civilization would collapse. In today's world, we have grown further from our relationship with nature, divorce. Life is fast-paced, filled with lists of to-dos and work that is to be completed in a timely manner. But it is vital that many of you continue to start to unplug in your garden, or start to unplug in your garden, take a bath in the forest, and stop to listen to the miraculous songs from your local birds, and most importantly, get sciency. In closing, I am certain some of you are asking yourself, how do I practice eco-spirituality, or rather, where can I start? On page 10, you will find a list of sustainable practices to help empower your new chapter in eco-spirituality if you choose. On the last page of your packet, is a list of books, podcasts to listen to in the garden, TV shows, and documentaries that have changed my life, and I really want to share that information with you all. If at any point anyone wants to learn more or has any questions or problems in the garden, my email is located on the cover page of the packet. Thank you, everyone, for your undivided attention, your kindness, and taking your drink from the science fire hose. <laughs> a special thanks to Keith and Barbara Walker, for welcoming me on this unforgettable journey. Thank you, everyone. It was our pleasure to have you, Sarah. So how fortunate we are tonight to come together and share our stories. And I'm pleased to announce that when she was talking about the indigenous, indi sorry, indi indigenous. thank you, indigenous, stories, that Reverend Anthony will be continuing to share in this vast topic with his sermon series this year, beginning October 20th, focused on the book Braiding Sweetgrass. So I'm going to close out the evening with one more of the principles.
and it's principle number seven, the law of dharma, dharma and how it applies to gardening. This law states, my life is in harmony with the cosmic law. Gardening can be a living example of this in your life. Working with nature to produce food is a truly blessed act. There's something special about watching your crops, crops sprout up after all your preparation, your work, and anticipation. There is a quiet reassurance in yourself when you are able to eat what you and the elements have created together. The enhanced relationship you can build with nature and yourself in self-reliance can be moving. In our closing words, in our lives, may we know the holy meaning, the mystery that breaks in in every moment. May we live at peace with our world and at peace with ourselves. And may the love of truth guide us in our every day. And as we extinguish our chalice, the words are on the bottom of your order of service if you don't know them. We extinguish this chalice but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we meet again. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.